Okay, so we have a kind of surprise speaker. Um, last year, I was reading the German tech hacker news, and I come across this image, and it's like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, cool. This guy at DEF CON like, hacked a safe. And around the same time, um, we decided to do the Open Hardware Summit last year in Denver. So I thought it was kind of the perfect opportunity to bring in um, Nate, who is the founder of SparkFun. And I said, Nate, I really want you to give a keynote. Um, please give a keynote. You're in Denver. It's your hometown. Like, represent. He's like, no, you know, I can't. Like, it's like, well, no, no, you're going to do it. It's going to be great. It's fine. Don't worry. Everyone's going to be excited to see you. Well, you know, Alicia's like, pregnant. <laughs> and um, the due date's on the summit. And I was like, okay, well. So um, this year, he's here, Alicia's here, and um, I'm really excited to get him on stage. And so I just told him about two hours ago that he was to be giving a talk, and he agreed. So I want to welcome uh, Nate uh, onto the stage. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So, um, yeah, um, I'm Nathan. I'm from SparkFun, and I'm going to try to um, just tell you a little story about SparkFun, some safe hacking, and some uh, recent work that I've been doing. Um, as it goes, is this going to work? Oh, I don't like presenter view. Um, I really like answering questions. I like conversations. I like engaging the audience. So if you guys have any kind of questions about SparkFun or Slide or something else, not even in the presentation, please ask as we go. Um, this is some work I did for DEF CON about a year ago. Uh, this is the safe cracking that we did that Addy referred to. Uh, and a little bit of background about SparkFun. Back in 2002, this is where SparkFun started. This is an apartment up in student housing outside the University of Colorado. So it was me and a couple roommates, and there was like 12 people in this house, and I had a bedroom, and I started shipping little brown boxes out of my bedroom uh, electronics. I started this website and started selling stuff, and it grew, and it grew. And then I graduated from college, and I designed some boards, and then I started hiring people, and here we are 15 years later. <laughs> Uh, it was a uh, really good success. If you don't know about SparkFun, um, you, sir, in the SparkFun hoodie, hoodie are my hero. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a website. We sell stuff. Uh, the main thing here is that uh, I ran SparkFun for about 13 years. We're 15 years old, but for 13 years, I was founder and CEO. Two and a half years ago, we hired a CEO, and I replaced myself. And it was the best decision I've ever made. I love designing and building stuff. I love playing with circuits. I love playing with the newest technology. And while I can try to have meetings about vision and direction and getting everybody headed the right direction, it wasn't in my DNA. So we hired a CEO. Uh, his name is Glenn. He comes from Arrow, a very large, excellent company. He's incredible with business. I'm incredible with breakout boards. So we fit the right job descriptions. Finally, I'm back to designing stuff. So this is what my group does. SparkX, all we, we futz around. Whether it's uh, laser distance sensors or IMUs or thermopiles, magnetic array, flexible OLED. I love it. I love it all. I would love to tell you about every single one of these projects. Um, it's, it's a GitHub repository. It's an Eagle layout. It's an Arduino library. Uh, this is what makes me tick. Um, how, but the other thing that makes me tick is puzzles. Uh, so like locks, manipulative kind of disentanglement puzzles. I love those things, and my wife knows that. And so she bought me a safe off of Craigslist for $20. <laughs> Why was it $20? Because it had no combination. <laughs> you don't give an Arduino guy a safe with no combination. So for Christmas, very heavy, uh, it, it, no combination, How, what do you do? You, you obviously build a robot. So um, <laughs> my group put together this thing. We'll get into the technical specs. But um, first, bad decision number one is we live streamed it on YouTube, the, the safe cracking. So like it's watching paint dry on YouTube. Um, but we, we got it open. The combination, 24066, uh, took us about 45 minutes, which was like shocking. Um, nothing in the safe, no ham sandwich or anything else. Uh, so that's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, how, d <laughs> how do these safes work? If you're unaware, there are th three digits to the combination, right? three numbers, 260044, whatever it is. So there's three dial, uh, three disks inside. The object is to line up those slots so that when you pull down on the handle, the 
through the three slots and you can get it open. Uh, this is the robot. It's magnetically heared. This was designed so that if it works properly, you'll never know I was there. <laughs> If we look, we got a motor, we got a handle puller, we got an Arduino. What does the internals look like? Uh, well, the, the main thing is a, a stepper motor. This is a stepper motor. It's a DC motor with a gear head on it. You get 8,400 ticks on the encoder for one revolution of dial. Now, what that means is that externally, we can use that to do some sneaky stuff. Um, well, this is the 3D printed coupler with a photo gate so we know where zero is. This is the handle puller. Again, 3D printed, some very fancy string and a servo. You can pull on the handle every try, okay? Uh, so this is what the electronics look like. We have an Arduino with a shield, a servo, go uh, button, a mode driver. 12 volt power supply display, oh, blah, blah, you know, all basic stuff. It's a pretty straightforward thing. It's an Arduino with a motor controller, right? That's all this is. If you can control a motor and a servo, you can crack open a safe. Um, <laughs> it's pretty scary. Uh, this is the thing. It's a, it, if, if the dial has 100 numbers on it and there's three digits to that combination, that's a very large problem set. Okay, if it's 10 seconds per test, so I, I clear the dials and I dial in the first number, dial in the second number, dial in the third number, pull on the handle, doesn't work. That takes 10 seconds. If it takes me, uh, it, it would take me, worst case, 115 days to brute force that safe open. So what can we prove to, do to improve that? We found some sneaky tricks. Uh, in the end, we can open the safe in about 1.2 hours, worst case scenario. So what are the, the sneaky things? Uh, the main one is that they designed this internal disk. Uh, it has 12 indentations, and those indentations are there so that when you pull down on the handle and twist the dial, you fall into one of those indentations. You then can't feel the other dials, okay? So it's a safety feature. They built in this thing to prevent you from cracking the safe. Well, it turns out um, we measured those 12 indentations, and you can see the solution slot. The solution slot is actually uh, uh, more th uh, the, the solution slot is wider than the other 11 indents. Each indent is 0 0.201 inches. The width of the solution slot is 0 0.250. That's really small, right? That, that's not much difference unless you have a very tight tolerance motor. And so we can take measurements from the outside of the safe and determine where that solution slot is. Now, what, what the heck am I talking about? Um, you pull on the handle, you tell the motor to turn, and you take the, the width of those things. This is what it looks like on a serial terminal. You step through the 12 indentations, you take some measurements. There's a whole bunch of numbers here. But the main thing is that that number sticks out like a sore thumb. What that number tells you is that 6 is the solution to the third dot. So within about 20 seconds, you know, we talked about how it had those three numbers, 22, 0, 0, 57. We figured out 57 in the first 20 seconds when we walked up the safe. Okay? So then um, you start turning and doing all this stuff, and um, you have about 1.2 hours to open that thing up. Well, if you've ever been to DEF CON, the speaking slots are 45 minutes long. <laughs> how do you get it open in 45 minutes? With a whole lot of luck. So you talk, about, you talk about demo fail. This is probably the most, the, you guys are cool, but DEF CON is the most unforgiving audience there is. <laughs> and so when we thought about this, we applied for the talk and we got, oh cool, we're going up on stage. We bought the safe in Vegas. Talk about, talk about a weird experience. Like you get an Uber, you go to Home Depot, you buy a safe, it's me and three guys, and the, they're, they're like, what are you doing with the safe? And we kind of tell them about it, and they're like, oh, that's weird. And then you walk, you walk back through the casino, one guy has the safe-cracking robot, and one guy has the safe, and all the security, like, they look at me with the, the robot, and they're like, yeah, whatever. And they look at the guy with the safe, and they're like, oh, that, that's funny, you think you're gonna win money this weekend. <laughs> So we get the safe, put it up on stage, we unbox it on stage, we attach the robot, I start my talk, and about 31 minutes later, we had a brand new safe that we didn't know the combination open in front of everybody in the audience. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, so uh, all open source hardware, if you want to check it out, we wrote a, a pretty fun uh, tutorial about it. Um, next, as that was last year's kind of hardware, I want to tell you about this year's hack and this year's hardware. Uh, we're going to talk about a big pick and place machine that we've been hacking in my group called SparkX. Uh, the, in the particular machine is a very cheap 
Chinese machine. There's a couple different manufacturers of this type of machine. This one is the Charm High version. This cost us $2,800. Okay, now, in the terms of pick and place, that may sound like a lot of money. Um, the pick and place machines at SparkFun start, we bought two. We, the first one we bought at $350,000, the second one was $415,000. So this is one one hundredth, less than one one hundredth of those pr uh, professional machines. Now, there's obvious differences, um, but this one was just astounding. Uh, we initiated this purchase on Monday before Thanksgiving. Okay, um, started the back and forth with the vendor in China, uh, got the wire transfer sent, they shipped it DHL, I had it the following Tuesday. It was eight days. Now those larger machines, you say, hey, I would like to buy one of those, you, know, you go back and forth and back and forth, you say, okay, please take my money, you give them, you know, $350,000, you get, then get to wait 12 weeks on the good side for that machine to appear. So this, really fast, very flexible. Now let's talk about some of the benefits of this thing. I'm gonna show you a little video. Boop, 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 boop. What's a pick and place machine do? Well, it prevents you from having to place all of those LEDs. Um, <laughs> has a vacuum nozzle, sucks up the components, goes to the position on the board and places it. That flashing light is a webcam. It uses computer vision to detect the boundary box around the component and adjust the position as it picks and places. So it uses a vision system to give you a, a little bit uh, better um, placement data. So it's, it's actually pretty precise. Oh, please stop. There we go. Um, so we've got a, a very cheap, very good machine. Um, the problem with these machines is the software. So when you buy one of these machines, uh, you get it and you say, okay, when you saw the, they give you a license file. They have locked down the communication protocol between your computer and the machine. The machine enumerates as a COM port. It's just sending serial packets back and forth. Anybody could write software for this thing. The problem is that they've encrypted it. They've locked it down for some reason. I don't know why. Really, really bad software. Each one of these buttons is, is you know, it's in English, but what does Tafar mean? I don't know. Click it, right? It's, this is how we learned how to use the, this machine. The, the documentation is very, very poor. The translations are to a little uh, left to be desired. Um, so, you know, we, we learned how to use it, uh, and it worked pretty well. We then wrote um, an Eagle ULP script. We, we wrote some software that sends our PCB designs to the machine so that our setup time is almost zero. So this means that very, th this little machine is very flexible. We can design and produce uh, panels of PCBs very quickly. Uh, I had this machine. I purchased it because there was a gentleman in Canada who had the similar machine. And then as he and I started collaborating on this software, uh, a German uh, person in Germany emailed us and said, oh, that's really good software. Mind if I work on it with you? And we all had the same machine. So it was like, well, let's start a, a Google group, right? So we can email each other. That Google group has since grown to 130 people. So we have this community that we just sort of stood up over the last six months, and people are emailing back and forth at different experiences. Um, so uh, this is September 7th. So this is, uh, what, 20 days ago. Um, Jason says, hey, I think the software may have the ability to do firmware updates. Uh, this is, I got this stick. This is the firmware on it. The size is this. Um, I haven't really figured it out, but does anybody else want to work on this? September 11th, it seems this thing is encrypted by an XOR operation. Um, some part of it of uh, valid strings, mostly at the end of file appear. Uh, September 11th, um, note the timestamp is, uh, yep, later that day. Uh, Michael chimes in, yeah, it's fully derived from a JSON key, blah, blah, blah. Trick was to find the correct offset in the files. Again, um, Michael, 12 hours later, hey, here's some source code for decrypting and e encrypting the firmware. <laughs> what is that, five days? Five days for these folks to figure out how to decrypt the firmware. Now the goal really is to just like get out of the way, remove the software so that we can run proper software on this machine. Um, and so uh, for those of you that don't know Jason, he started a group uh, called Open PNP or Open Source Pig Place. So uh, three days ago, Jason emailed the group and said, hey guys, um, I've got the first uh, steps of Open PNP running. 
Um, careful, you can totally mess up your machine, um, but for those who are interested, uh, kick, kick the tires and let me know. We are still trying to figure out how to do some nozzle rotations and some different stuff, um, but uh, you saw the software before. Um, this is Jason's software. And for those of you that don't run pick and place machines, it's, it's not too exciting. Uh, we'll jump ahead to, oh, I can't jump ahead. Well, um, this is much better software. This is a much better user interface. And so we take a $2,800 machine and empower it. Make it, it's not professional grade by any means, but we're taking an off the shelf tool and using the open source community to make it even more powerful. Um, so I, I have high expectations for uh, this machine and the software, and uh, it's just fun to watch a community come together. Um, there was somebody in Italy that figured out the XOR checksum. Uh, Jason, I have no idea where he is. I think he's in the US somewhere. Uh, folks from Canada, Germany, all over the world are participating to try to make their own machines better. So I think, what did we learn from all this? Um, open source for the win. Um, walled garden vendors, you need to go away. Uh, and then but never underestimate a motivated global community. Right? These folks are passionate about pick and place machines. These folks hate security. And if you get in their way, they will reverse engineer your encryption uh, and make a better tool. You'd think um, we have attempted to contact the makers of the machine in China. Charm, Charm High is the manufacturer. And they, they just don't understand what we're doing. Um, although, oddly, ironically, they're going to see a huge spike in sales. <laughs> once we figure this out. So, um, are there any kind of questions I can answer? That's all I've got. What kind of questions can I answer for you guys? Spark fun or pick and place or safe related? Yes, sir. Question is, have I ever thought about making my own pick and place? Uh, for a brief second, yes. Um, it is, m people have tried, people have failed. Uh, I leave the manufacturing of machines up to those who are best at it. Um, a XY stepper motor gantry is, is workable, but when you get down into the details of all the bits, uh, it gets difficult quickly. The main challenge is features, and so how you present the component in a uh, repeatable way is um, the magic, and this machine has a very sneaky, cheap way of doing that, and so we just went with off the shelf. Yes, sir. Oh, I can't tell you. Uh, uh, we're working on it. Uh, so I'll talk to you next year. Yeah, I'll see you at the next Open Hardware Summit. Yeah, I'll be there. Uh, yes, sir. Hofer button. Too far. Oh, we should totally. Yes, absolutely. I gotta, I gotta email Jason and say just put in a yeah a Topher button. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Have you been able to figure out what the motivation behind their locking up their proprietary protocol even is? Could uh, so the question. Um, why is the vendor encrypting the protocol? Why would they want to keep people out? Uh, there was a discussion about that on the mailing list. Uh, near as they can figure, it's uh, cultural. So they believe that uh, it's so easy to copy the machine. Um, Charm High is not the people that came up with uh, this design. Charm High was just uh, one of five different vendors that sell a nearly identical design. And so the way that they differentiate themselves in their own mind is the software, which is horrible. So it's, I, we, we can't explain it, yeah. Yes? I'm actually really impressed with the major obvious adapted uh, equipment I've ordered from China. Mm -hmm. uh, but in many cases, it's exactly the situation, like uh, the laser cutter, and people have their own software and so forth. Mm -hmm. But do you have any other uh, equipment The question is, uh, are there other types of equipment uh, that come, the low cost that come from other places that SparkFund would recommend? Um, 
it really varies on your application. I can give you an example of uh, a machine that we purchased from China. It was an automated uh, solder paste stenciling machine. Okay, so whenever you're manufacturing stuff, you got to get solder paste onto a board, and so this thing would, you know, had a couple paddles and would come down with the stencil and go back and forth. Uh, it, it did not work at all. It was a, you know, whatever, $2,000 paperweight. Uh, it was really bad, and, um, as, you know, the, the problem was is that we, the next step, well, the next option was a $45,000 optically aligned stenciling machine. Now, once you go there, it's wonderful. It is amazing how precise and how better your yields are, right? But that's $2,000 to $45,000. It's just, the, the difference is incredible. The, the machine that did work for us, um, I don't know if you're familiar with hot bar soldering. No. Uh, uh, if there's a display and you have a capped on tape connector, you don't insert it into a connector. You need to solder the entire connector to the board. You don't do that uh, 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 pin by pin. You do that with a soldering iron that's a big hot bar. It comes down and solders it. Um, we purchased that one for a couple thousand dollars and we still use it today. It's a fabulous piece of production machinery. So the challenge is that it's hit or miss and we don't yet have a way to figure out what machines are good before you order them. Uh, but I can recommend this one. Yes? Do you have a favorite Spark X Do I have a favorite Spark X part? Of course I do. Uh, yes. Um, so I'm really into puzzles, right? Uh, harp. Do, 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 do. There we go. Um, um, so the prototype harp was um, our attempt at a game. So this is called the uh, hardware alternate reality puzzle, or harp. And so you get this board for $60, 30 I don't know if it's on, it's on sale, $30. Um, you get this board <laughs> for $30. And you get it, and it arrives broken. Okay. So what, what we did is we made a game, and the game is that uh, a, a prototype has made it out of the SparkX labs, and it's really an AI that's gone rogue, and they're really, we're doing bad stuff in SparkX, and please help me, and it, uh, it's a series of hardware challenges. Um, what we found out, it, we thought we were the bee's knees. We thought, yeah, it's going to change the world. Um, games are hard. And uh, to do it properly uh, is not for electrical engineers to do. Um, so. <laughs> We, we, we really enjoyed making this. What we found is that we need to partner with somebody like uh, uh, Steam or like a true good game developer. We can absolutely pull off the hardware to do some really magical things. It's the, it's the narration and how you tie those challenges together in a unique way. So that's kind of my proudest product. Um, even if it was a failure, right? Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. That fits every rectangular board on the planet. Yep. Can we, can we build against the PC or anything that we can just buy off the shelf, slap some glue on it, and make it waterproof? The, the question is, um, there's a lot of different development boards out there. The challenge is sort of waterproofing and enclosing that so that we can actually take it into the wild. Um, I agree with you. I don't have a good solution. Um, things like uh, potting. So uh, just encapsulating the entire thing is some sort of non-conductiveness, or um, you can coat it in various things. Um, the, I don't yet have a good solution. May, perhaps uh, the, the, the crowd knows. Perhaps we can chat later. Um, but I, I, yeah, don't have a good. <laughs> uh, yes, in the back. The question is, how far have we been able to push this machine? Um, you can see this, the board that's loaded in there is a standard panel size. Um, we're cheap, so we order less than 100 millimeters squared because JLC PCB has pretty good rates if it's less than 100 millimeters. Um, so it can do that. Um, we've seen some designs. There are some, guy, uh, the, there are some folks on the uh, email list that design controller boards for uh, pinball machines, and those range into the like, multiple square feet. Um, so these machines can handle it. Um, I'm very, like, this picture is interesting. Uh, what you should see is the picture of the tape of, at the output. The used, we have pushed a nearly 8,000 boards through this machine 
since Thanksgiving. It's quite capable. And the, the, yeah, it, it'll, it'll do the job. Uh, so does that answer your question? OK. Yes, Jason. Uh, so uh, for something like this where you wanted to try to bring up, um, it seems like the, the, me the mechanical part would have been stuff that's hard for you. Yes. Replacing the stepper motor control with something super that generates stepper motor drivers seems like replacing electronics would have been easy. Yep. So why didn't you just go there instead of replacing the firmware? The, the question is, why didn't we just replace the innards versus uh, trying to decrypt the, the protocol? Um, the folks, uh, f for, for me, the software is usable enough that I can produce boards. Um, I believe that the mailing list kind of took it personal. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that it was like, wait, this is encrypted? Why is this encrypted? No, we're, we're not going to allow this. And so they, th that, it was that sort of you know, bug in their bonnet. Um, uh, the, the folks on the mailing list are also uh, not necessarily comfortable replacing those nerds. So it's, it's a mixture of folks. Um, uh, cost might be another reason. It's like, this is a completely workable machine. We just need to send it the right serial commands. So I, yeah, that's the path they took. Yes, sir. Yes. If this is available to everyone and they can make their own boards, from your standpoint, would that would be a bad thing? Ah, and then destroy my business model. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yes and no. So uh, I have said for the, the longest time that as long as technology is getting smaller, I have a place in this world. So if you think about uh, the, the, the young woman who spoke this morning about ha accidentally eating four millimeter uh, microcontrollers, right? things get smaller. And so as long as things get smaller to the point where I can't hook up wires to it, then SparkFun has a reason to exist. Now, whether that business model lasts for two years, 10 years or 50 years, I'm not sure, but I agree with you, it's limited. Um, now, right now, uh, I enjoy f uh, uh, leveraging the, the, the gap that is created by the in inaccessibility to technology. That's why Sparkman's there, to give you access to those technologies. Um, I am all for changing the business model when technologies exist to allow us to build a GPS module from scratch. But until that 3D printer can print me a tuned ceramic antenna, then I'm going to keep building what I build. Uh, yes, sir. And then Noah, I'll get to you. Oh, Joel. Uh, question is, um, how do we reflow these boards? Um, Joel, your intuition is completely correct. We cheat. Um, we take this off of the machine. We then walk these boards to the SparkFun very large, as long as this uh, platform is, uh, reflow oven. So it's a multi-stage, very nice reflow oven uh, that helps a lot with your yield. Do I have any smaller options? Personally, no, because I can cheat and walk over to it. Um, however, there's a, a large community that is modifying reflow ovens. Convection toaster ovens work, hot plates work, um, all sorts of, uh, but I don't know the squishy middle above a toaster oven, but below what we have. Um, Noah. Mm -hmm. So, the, 
the, the question is, why not go to the, maybe not this manufacturer, but some manufacturer and say, hey, can you build me a more open source hardware pick and place machine, or can you at least build me one that's open? Um, uh, the, it's possible, yes. Um, but my business model, the way that I make money, is by designing and building things. And so it, this is sort of a tertiary project. And it's sort of, you know, we got it working well enough. Um, it, that, I believe, is a business opportunity for someone. But the challenge is always, if I can just go direct to the manufacturer, how are you going to make money? It, it, it's, a, it's kind of a funky business model. Yes, sir. Yeah. Question is, uh, does SparkFun accept product ideas? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, there's a, a, a product idea submission page on SparkFun. Awesome. Well, yeah. I think. Uh, any more other questions? Oh, yeah. One over there. That, that's a really fun question. Uh, the first part, what was the question, um, was uh, would I have found a CEO sooner um, knowing now what I know? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, there was uh, from years you know, 10 to 13 that were really, really painful. Um, and it was just you know, fish out of water. Uh, but you get the right people in the right spot and everybody's happier and a lot more productive. Um, the second question was maybe we could have found an I didn't quite understand that. When I first started SparkFun, um, you, there is no book that says this is how you do this thing. So I sort of spun it up, started shipping stuff, and then uh, anyone in the U.S. who runs a business knows the IRS starts sending you bills. And the IRS, uh, our tax system, says, hey, you owe us $2,000. And you say, what? No, I don't owe you. Why? What are you talking about? And so that's the day that you sort of figure out that, y no, I don't need to pay that tax, or yes, I do. You don't, there is no uh, book on dummies to tell you how to deal with the IRS. So as makers and DIY folks, we do that because we love to do that. Um, it, it, after however 10 years of that, I had sort of turned over all the stones that I wanted to and learned everything that I wanted to. And I could, f I, I knew the area that I wanted to focus on and sort of, you know, big vision strategy heading toward the future. I knew that that was not something I wanted to really focus on. And so that's when I decided to pull an off the shelf solution, pull sh CEO off the shelf and use that instead. Cool. Yeah. Um, Thank you all. Uh, please come say hi later. I'd love to chat. Cool. Thanks.